What's up, guys? Welcome to the sesh. Today we have a special guest. It's Jose Olivares, the economics lecturer for SEC, going on five years, correct? That's right. So kind of touch on exactly what you do and what we're going to talk about, because I think this is very important for people to understand, because right now we're in inflation, recession's coming, the economy seems like it's collapsing and burning everywhere. So kind of give us some uh, some safe haven here, man. <laughs> All right, so like most of my job is just, um, as an educator, most of my job just um, is um, having classes um, with my students, and uh, we also do what we call a... Uh, college service hours, which just entails like special projects that we may have. Um, most, of, most of the time um, I'm doing special projects with universities across the border, just forming partnerships. Um, we've been doing for the past three years a, a project called the Binational Educational Symposium, which is basically a partnership between Index Reynosa, which is um, a group of um, maquiladora um, professionals that um, um, deal with import, import and export issues in the region and seven universities um, in, in Reynosa, Mexico. And what we do is every year in, around November, we have a conference where um, we bring in students to learn about you know, real life skills that they'll need when they graduate. So that's one of the projects that I'm working on. And we also do, uh, I also do a lot of stuff with uh, financial literacy. Uh, that's something that I'm starting to work on here at the university. I remember when I was taking courses uh, in economics and I did not understand it. I didn't understand it till years later when I actually started making money. And then you see that how you're starting to make money and you start to lose it. That's when you start getting educated yeah, about it. One of the problems with um, our current educational system is that, um, and that how it differs from, from other educational systems. Like um, I, I, I've had the privilege to work in other parts of the world. Um, I, I did a, um, five years of uh, teaching in the Middle East, and a lot of the um, K-12 schools there are Br British-based. Okay. And um, the British system actually, um, they make students have like an economics course basically all through high school, and they're learning about savings, investment, you know, all kinds of government bonds, t like basically what we call like treasury bills here, things like that. And they're learning throughout high school. Uh, you know, I would tutor kids that were um, in 10th, 9th grade. Um, and here, unfortunately, like your experience, my experience, you took it your last semester mm -hmm. of your senior year when you were checked out. And that's one of the, the barriers that I encounter when I'm teaching these classes. I, I, I start talking about investments, mutual funds, securities, and it just goes over people's head. Yeah. So well, that's well, part of what we want to reach out to the community through STC and, and reach the community and talk to them about what they can do with their money because the idea with savings a lot of times here is literally putting it under the mattress yeah, yeah. for a lot of people. Well, I mean, it's, right now it doesn't seem like a bad thing to, to keep it <laughs> under your mattress. Well, well actually, with, with the current situation, you can take advantage of a lot of things that are going on, with, especially with interest rates going up. Yeah. Um, and and some, so hopefully that's some of the things that we can talk about today. Absolutely. Um, you know, and, and it's not taking advantage necessarily of, the bad, of a bad thing. It's just understanding how the economy works. And that there's trade-offs, uh, you know, understanding um, economics is just the study of scarcity. And, and whenever you start talking about scarcity, it's just like the limited nature of things, right? And Okay, so hold on. Break that down for me because I'm a dummy here, okay. all right? So if you were to use like the three, the three top things that you would learn from going through an economics class... What are those things, and why are they important? Right, so, so the the first first things first, economics, whether you're studying um, macroeconomics, microeconomics, environmental economics, whatever economics you're studying, it's all about scarcity, okay. the limited nature of things. So, understanding that and understanding that life has trade-offs, you're always gonna have to make a choice. So that's the first thing I want everybody to understand. So an example of that would be at the, at the most basic thing is like when, when I go down the street and buy buffalo wings and there's, they, they're running out so the prices go up 
Is, is that an make example? It, let's, let, let's make it more basic. You bought some buffalo wings, so you cannot use that money to put into your savings account. Gotcha. Okay. That, that's, that, or if you want to make it into a more macro issue like what we're seeing, and this is going to make some people upset or it's going to blow their mind or however they want to see it. If we want to fix inflation, we're going to have to get some people unemployed. We have to get people unemployed. Yes. Why? Because you cannot fix both problems at the same time. So then what the, gov- what the government is doing is using unemployment as a tactic to bring... Not, not, they're not using unemployment necessarily, but that's going to be the end result. Okay. And that's some of the data that I collected for you today and it's, to that's, show you how that works. And that's to bring down interest rates. No, that's to bring down inflation. To bring down inflation. Yes. Okay. So... Unfortunately, that's that's the idea of trade-offs. You know, you can't. I I know there's this idea that you can have it all. You can have it all. <laughs> Sometimes you can't. Yeah. And and, and that's just life, right? So, so the why that's, that's that's number one. Okay. And then if you're taking my courses, what I want students to understand is what we're going to be talking about today. To read the newspaper or. Or now I guess I'm kind of dating myself, right? I'm, <laughs> I'm 40 years old. I still read. Uh, now it's online, right? New, online newspapers and, and articles and things like that. But uh, if you're reading Twitter, mm-hmm. right, which is how people consume the news now, I guess. If you're reading Twitter and you see a, a, an article, that you can dissect it and say, oh, that makes sense or it doesn't make sense. Because you're learning about the basic economic variables and how they work. Give us an example. So what I would like, for example, um, we're talking about inflation and unemployment, right? So, and this is something that uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and, and be, and I always do this caveat because I like to be as unbiased as I can. And this is something that all politicians do. I always relate it back to politics in my class, right? All politicians, regardless of whether you're a Republican or a Democrat, they're going to use the data to their advantage. So there's this famous saying in statistics, there's lies, damn lies, and then there's statistics. <laughs> so one of, the, one of the things that, like, for example, the Biden administration was taking credit for was the, the rise in uh, in jobs or the the lowering of unemployment since we took over unemployment went down well of course right you opened up the economy yeah right so that's the ex- like that's what i want students to digest like oh well yeah well that makes sense like did he have anything to do with it did he create the jobs who created the jobs who is the economy? Is the president the economy? Is Congress the economy? Is the Supreme Court the economy? No, we are the economy. Who created the jobs? We did. You did. By having, like, a, you're an entrepreneur. Mm-hmm. You create jobs, right? Uh, so who's creating the jobs? Is the president creating the jobs? Right. Right. So understanding those basic things so that when you show up at the ballot, like you're like you're getting rid of your like of all the extra stuff that shouldn't matter right. and you're just making an informed decision of whatever benefits you mm-hmm. right cuz that's what you should vote on right what whatever you're going to the left or you're going to the right you should vote for your best interest and and I'm not going to get into what side you should pick but there's a lot of you know there's a lot of fluff everywhere there's a lot of fluff there and 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 again I just Gave an example about Biden. Again, it, the same thing happened with Trump. Yeah. Right? He would take credit for stuff that he had nothing to do with. And that's the kind of stuff that I always tell my students. Look, and I show them, like, look, see this tweet? Let's dissect it. Yeah. Things like that. So when you read it, like, you understand what's going on. Understood. So just, just as an example, and I don't want people to say, oh, he's anti-Biden. That's not at all what, yeah. I, what, what I'm saying. It's just... Just an example. Make an informed decision. Yeah, making informed decisions based on what you learn. And, 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 and through a basic economics course, you should be able to do that. Okay. Okay, yeah, cool. So. Well, listen, I had some questions for you. Yeah, I was yeah. super interested in because I, I ran across a statistic the other day that said 10 to 12 million businesses across the United States fail every year. Right. 
And that's kind of alarming because I've, I've seen, well, I've lived in the Rio Grande Valley my whole life, and I've seen businesses close year after year after year, and I, I see them closing record numbers after COVID. Another interesting thing is I just came back from Phoenix, Arizona, and for a conference, and across the street, they had this beautiful plaza. Mm -hmm. And I would say 90% of that whole plaza, it's huge, by the way, this is Phoenix, Arizona, there's 1.6 million people there. 90% of that plaza, all those businesses were closed. And I asked the guy that was cleaning up, he's like, none of those businesses have come back since COVID. A couple have tried. They didn't make it. Why, why is this so difficult? What, what is going on here in America that, that this is going on? So um, there's a lot of things. And um, first thing I would say is education, first and foremost, because... The, while I'm teaching, I don't teach necessarily a business course. I always think of economics as the, the mama of business, right? So all the concepts that you're learning, for example, in my microeconomics class where we look at, we dissect more in detail like the firm, the business, right? We go over costs and uh, consumer behavior and things like that. There's a basic lack of understanding of basic principles um, about business. So for example, something that students always argue with me is that if you lower prices, you'll get more customers. Now, what do you think about that? Uh, I come from a place where if you have a superior product, you do really good in the marketplace, you offer the best services and products possible, people will pay no matter what. So I don't really care about price going down because if it's a good product and it's something that I really need, I will buy it. Exactly. Right. And also you probably, when you're looking at a product about creating a product, you probably did some kind of market research mm -hmm. and you're looking at other businesses that are around that offer similar products. And it's like, oh, well, they're charging this, they're charging that. So I'm going to charge somewhere in the, in the ballpark, right? Maybe a little bit higher, maybe a little bit lower, but it's going to be around the ballpark, right? So that's a basic economic principle. You don't undersell yourself. Mm -hmm. And that's a basic problem that a lot of people encounter here. They're always trying to undersell themselves. Bring that mic a little bit closer to your face. So they're, they're always trying to undersell their product. Like, and I mean that with, with their pricing. They're trying to compete in a very competitive market with their prices when they should be competing with quality, they should be competing with cost structures. Like how do you reduce your cost? What are things that you can do to your business that are gonna lower your bottom line so that you can become profitable in this economy? So let's stay on that subject right there. What are some of those tactics that businesses can employ? Well, again, I'm not an expert in business, but, you know, do you really need to, for example, hire a marketing firm in today's age? Is there a lot of your own advertising that you can do on social media? Um, do you need to go outside your residence to start your business sometimes, right? A lot of what we saw after the pandemic is that a lot of businesses went totally online, mm -hmm. right? Obviously, there's services that still require you to have an office space, and we understand that. But can you go without some of those things that are going to raise your overhead, right? And so these are the things that you really have to go into and, and plan out. You know, having a, like, entrepreneur is just not about an idea. It's about implementing the idea. Yeah. So a lot of, like, and, and, and even then, once you have a business plan, a lot of people like to just, like, look at the business plan and say, this is a perfect business plan. Why is it, like, why is my business failing? The business plan is just like, it shouldn't be fixed in stone. It can evolve and evolve because it's like something that I heard from like the fighting world, Mike Tyson. You know, everybody has a plan until they get punched, punched in the in face, the face yeah. right? 
So it's the same thing with a business. You can have a, a perfect business plan, and then you hit the first customer. What are you supposed to do? Right? It needs to evolve. Get feedback. Maybe the product that you th maybe the product that you were thinking about selling to the customer is not the product that you should be selling, right? So a very common business here in the valley is what? Oh, there's taco stands. There's the yeah. <laughs> everybody here makes the best tacos, mm -hmm. right? So you think, oh, I want to I'm gonna make a taco stand. I'm gonna get a food truck. Well, you have a business plan. You go to the bank. They give you a loan. You get your food truck. Okay. You hit the clients. Maybe you shouldn't be hitting 17th Street at night. Maybe when you hit that first client, maybe your best road of action is hitting businesses during the day. Mm -hmm. Right? But no, you want to do it at night because that's how you think about selling tacos. Taco sales are at night. That's when people come out of the the club they're hungry yeah. and so you have this fixed idea on how to sell tacos right but maybe once you hit the marketplace that idea has to change too so that's what i'm talking about like this this whole like it's just education on on entrepreneurship and things like that and so i always tell my students like stay in school like learn these concepts because you know everybody has ideas mm -hmm. But businesses fail all the time. It's just that the implementation of ideas is where a lot of businesses fail. And unfortunately, there's been a lag of people adapting to this new economy. The new economy, the pandemic brought us into this new economy where... Technology. Technology. Yeah. Technology. Like, where do people go shopping? Online now. Online? Yeah. And, and and think about the beauty of Amazon. You know, I was I was listening to this in the podcast. This is not my own thoughts. I was just listening, and, and I thought, yes, that's a beauty of Amazon. For example, um, you buy something for five dollars at Amazon. You get it. You don't like it. You want to return it. And a lot of times, Amazon tells you what? Here's your money. Yeah. Keep it. Right. How can you compete against that? Exactly. And it's not that it's impossible. The question is, how do you compete against that? Well, I'll tell you right now. It's a now, real question. Yeah, I'll tell you right now the way that businesses can compete because there's a, there's a difference between, you know, going into a business and all these taco stands, or let's use that for example. They're going to all these different places. The one thing that's going to matter is customer service. And I want to go deeper into that because as a business owner, you're the business owner, you're hiring on people. And I've heard this, and maybe you can see if there's some truth to this, is that employees just simply don't care. At this point in their life, they know that they're expendable because after COVID happened, they're the first ones that are going to be gone because the business owner is always going to take care of their bottom line, which is their business. So along the way, employees figured out, you know what, I'm, I'm expendable. How do business owners, I feel like a lot of the power has shifted to the business owner, I mean, to the employee. A lot of the power has shifted to the, the employee and the business owner is like, well, shit, man, like I, I need these employees to run my business. How, how do I do that? Well, but at the same time, business owners are like, dude, I'm paying you. Like you need to do these things that I'm, I'm implementing here. So, I mean, yeah, give I me some you, insight I, I on that. I sent you this file, right? And it's the last slide. Maybe you can see it. And this is from the Federal Reserve, and you have the source there in the bottom. It says the percentage of technically automatable activities by industry using currently demonstrated technologies. I don't know if you have it on your screen. Let me grab it up real fast. Yeah. Explain that, please. Yeah. So basically, uh, this graph explains um, the percentage of your job that can already be done by some kind of technology, hmm. by area, right? That's a lot of, uh, wow, industries. <laughs> right? <laughs> so look at the top ones. Manufacturing. Food services, manufacturing, retail trade, agriculture, mining. So, well, the, the top, right? Let's look at the ones that are over, like 50 and over. Mm -hmm. Some of the ones that you talked about. 
agriculture, retail trade, food services, accommodation. So you were talking about customer service. Yeah. Right. So I would push back against what you mentioned. Is the power really in the employee? On the uh, like, is the power shifting to the employee? I think so because well, I I feel like for example, let me let me put myself in an, an employee's shoes. So if I were to get hired by a business right now, and I was uh, let's say at McDonald's, right, and I'm and I'm going back and forth arguing with customers that I don't even want to deal with in the first place, and now they're telling me crap, and I forgot coffee, I forgot their their milk for their coffee, so I'm getting bitched at over here, and then I go to my boss like, dude, what do I? I don't even enjoy this. He's like, well, you got to do it. So the employee morale just goes down, down. Okay, so but but then how is that translating into something useful for the employee? They still have to go to work. Like, is it translating into higher wages? Is Do they though? Because I would, I would say that a lot of employees just don't show up, and they're okay, like, right, well, whatever. Okay, but but then okay, so uh, or am I wrong? Because I, this is just well, what the, I the see unemployment. Here. So the unemployment numbers would show that right now we're we're overemployed. Like, the unemployment should usually hover around four percent. Right now we're at like a three point six. So there's plenty of jobs being filled. Mm -hmm. And Texas employment numbers, and we can get into that later, are predicted to still go up for this year. So there's plenty of jobs to go around. That's part of the reason why inflation numbers have been so difficult to get down. Right? And we again we can explain inflation and unemployment yeah. later on. But like my pushback is like, how does that translate into power? So if you're thinking about employee power for me that means that i can go to my boss and say hey pay me more or i'm not going to have to deal with this mm -hmm. right so is it translating into that now there has been some data that suggests that wages have gone up in texas right fine but at the end of the day if this graph is true right and this graph predicts that in the next 10 years some of these jobs are going to be gone we already see it in, for example, HEB, Walmart, Target. I don't need to hire a 17, 18 year old to, to be a, a, um, in the cash register. Right. I just need to have a responsible adult manager looking after five, six um, checkout units, checkout yeah. units mm -hmm. make sure that nobody's stealing anything. Right. I probably have a, already into that equation a certain amount of stuff that I can account to be stolen yeah, during the years, lost. like so some loss numbers that I, I already put into the system, calculated into the amount of money that I'm going to save with the employees. I don't have to hire. I don't have to pay insurance. I don't have to pay all these things, right? So it's cutting my overhead expenses. It's cutting my variable cost as well with the employees. So... Is the power with technology shifting to the employee or the employer? Yeah, I see. I, see, I understand what you're saying. So, so then, what happens to all those jobs once these these technology so takes that, over? That, that's the that, that that's the thing. Like, and that's when you start getting into universal income that some economists, some politicians have brought forth. Like, do we start like once the machines mm -hmm. take over, and we already started seeing. AI, AI <laughs> yeah. and, and that's scary, man. That, that, that I want to talk about that too in a bit. Like, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not an expert in ChatGPT or anything. Although I have some seen that, some applications that I want to use in my classroom. I had a, a fellow teacher explain to me how, you know, I do my own videos for my classes, and uh, he showed me a cool trick where you feed it into a ChatGPT kind of applet and it, it breaks down your video and it makes questions for you it basically makes a whole lesson plan like so if i make a video i can make a whole lesson plan with question test questions everything yeah so that's pretty cool so there's some cool applications but i'm just worried about you know you know you hear news stories about GP, chat gpt already lying to get into yeah uh, <laughs> i don't know anyways but what's like so when technology takes over so where are these jobs where are going. they? Yeah. They're, so they're gone. That's that's structural, right? The jobs are no longer there, and so that whole thing. Uh, a couple years passed. Uh, you might remember. You might not. It was uh, learn to code. Mm -hmm. It was a big like demeaning thing online. Just like, hey, you need to learn to code. Like, 
now it becomes real, right? So yeah, well, that's gone because now ChatGPT can code for you, and, and now that's even <laughs> gone, right? So it, it becomes and it happens so fast. It happens. It's and the it's, craziest part, and it's going to keep happening faster and faster. So it's difficult to say, and and all it takes is another pandemic to push us into that direction because we saw what this pandemic did and notice it was only six months yeah. of us being locked down and all these advancements came to play nobody wants their food touched nobody wants their items touched i want like you still have some ptsd call it let's call it that yeah. or a lack of a better Absolutely. term um there's still some of that right and, well, and you, we you still you still have some of those like you transferred some of those cash registered employees to what Target what, or Walmart? What do you still see? Uh, the curbside. Yeah. Right. So businesses have changed, and you're talking about like why are businesses failing? They didn't. They adapt. Are, they they didn't adapt, and so if you don't adapt, that's a big problem. Why are there so many vacancies? And like, there's a big thing going on right now with office space mm -hmm. and real estate. There's not a, like a lot of office space is not being rented out. Why? Businesses adapted. I don't need to rent the space. I can send a computer and all the equipment to my employee at home. I can. I already know who I can trust and who I can't. Right. I cut my losses with some of these people that weren't doing anything at home. I know like that person is responsible. Let me send. Let me let me modify their job description. They are now in charge of this and this. Let me raise their pay. You're out. They're in with a higher salary, right? And you know, office space, you're gone. Yeah. And it's great. Employees love it. I can work with just my uh, my tie. And yeah. I, I can <laughs> have sweat. Up. Yeah, with some shorts and a, and a nice shirt. Yeah. And it's great. Yeah. Another um, thing. Another thing that I've noticed too is like when when business owners are working on their business, they're not really working on their business. So uh, what I've seen is that the business owners won't actually go in and do the work that they need to be doing that they did to get to that point. But when they get to a big level, they're like, well, I'm not going to do that stuff anymore. Why should I do it? This is why I hired people. But the fact is, if you really wanted your business to succeed, you would do whatever the fuck you need to do to make it succeed. Period. Right. right. Period. So can you kind of touch on that? Well, I mean, it's just, you know, these jobs require 60, 80 hour weeks, right? If you wanna if you wanna run a business, so like you wanna be your own boss, it's gonna require more out of you mm -hmm. at, at any given point, right? So so there's this idea, I wanna be my own boss. So again, economics, trade off. You're working forty hours, maybe fifty hours at your regular job, you're making so but you don't like your boss, you don't like your current job, you're like, I wanna be my own boss. You need to realize that if you're gonna be your own boss, those hours are maybe gonna double. Yeah. And a lot of people don't realize that. Well, and not not only that, I mean, if you're going into business for yourself, well, there's a number of things that you need to learn because you need to learn sales because you need to get business. You need to learn how to hire. You need to learn how to market. You, you have to wear a lot of hats to be able to make and, it work. And, and that's the thing about like when you when you're an entrepreneur and you have a, a great idea. And so let's say that it's no longer like a like a restaurant. It's a product. Right. A lot of the times, once, so you have investors, right? You offer a product. So let's think of a Shark Tank example, right? You have investors, they're investing in you, you're developing your product, you already showed it to customers, potential customers, they like it, they gave you some retro, uh, retroactive uh, information, you modified it, you have a working, um, you have a working model, and people like it. And now the investors see some profit to be made, mm -hmm. right? What's the first thing th those investors see in you now? Is this person going to be able to sell this, right? And sometimes the answer is no, Yeah. right? So that's when you become a liability to your investors, <laughs> unfortunately, right? So that's something that, you know, you have to learn. And if not... 
guess what? You're still going to be the owner. You're still going to be a shareholder, you know, majority shareholder or, or whatnot. But maybe you're not going to be part of the business. And that's that's just reality, mm -hmm. right? Because now your investors require you to sell the product. Because it's not the same to be a brilliant mind and to create a product. Maybe your job is to create the product, but that that's where you're needed. Yeah, the role has changed. The role has changed. You're no longer in charge of the company, per se, of selling the product. No, you're in charge of developing the product. Let us take over. Yeah. So there's part of that, um, but you're right. And that's where you... You know, a lot of people just need help. And, and I'm here to tell you, there's a lot of places that in the Valley that are here to help. So let's go into that. How, where, where are these places that people can find specific help? Look, and I guess I'm going to plug another university here, but I think, I think STC should be fine with this. <laughs> I think we're all part of this. We're all trying to serve the community, right? So when I was in, doing my undergrad, it was still called UTPA, right? So I was working at a place called... Um, the Veterans Business Outreach Center. That is still the place at UTRGV. I'm, I'm not necessarily because UTRGV grew so much that they changed office locations. It used to be on Klossner. But basically what we would do is be veterans would go in with business ideas and we would give them free services like business, uh, business planning classes, financial advice, conferences from business owners explaining what you need to do. We would connect them to banks, financiers, investors, mm -hmm. things like that. Those places at universities are still there, right? I know the veteran, I researched it yesterday just because I was thinking about, you know, why do businesses fail? A lot of times it's education. You don't have to go to school. You can just, education is just about sometimes just reaching out to a professional and they'll set you in the right way. Yeah. So if you're thinking about starting a business, and right now I'm just talking about veterans, right? But I'm sure next to us, there was just the business outreach center, which was just for non-veterans. They still might have that. I, I'm not sure. I'm not 100% sure. I know they still have the veteran outreach center, right? So go to those places. Ask around. Ask for resources, right? They offer free information for, for the community, mm -hmm. right? We, like, for example, us at STC, the Binational Educational Symposium, let's say that you have a business idea about bringing flowers from Mexico to the U.S., right? Or you, or you want to bring, you want to start importing Mexican chips, right? Well, attend our conference in November. It's free of charge. It's online. You don't have to show up anywhere. Just register click on a link, and learn from experts on what kind of paperwork you have to fill out, right? We'll put you in the right direction, right? We've had people from New York University give conferences, um, from Michigan give conferences, from East Carolina University, from UTSA, from Mexico, right? Last, last year, we had 2,000 attendees. We've had people attend our conference virtually, um, from Chile. Wow. Yeah, one of the biggest life hacks that I found is conferences because I just came back from one. It was a three-day three day, uh, coaching immersive class. And the great thing about that is the barrier to entrance isn't that much. It was a $500 ticket to get access to people that have business calls and, and are getting people on for like $25,000 per call. These are coaching. So these are the people that are coaching that charge $25,000 per call just for business advice, you can get to these conferences for 500 bucks, learn from all these people because they distill so much knowledge of their business knowledge from like 12, 20 years into one speech. I don't think people really understand that. Look, um, YouTube. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of, a lot of college professional, like I, I was just watching a, um, an entrepreneur, uh, um, what do they call it? An entrepreneur series. Um, I, f I forgot the name of um I got it because um, I got a link through a friend. I was like, hey, check this guy out. So I did. And I started going through all these videos. So he was talking about entrepreneurship. And I saw like two or three videos. And he was talking about some of the things I was talking about, like hitting the market, having a working model, 
you know, things that entrepreneurs um, face when they're, you know, creating a product, right? And he is um, a huge name, I guess. I forgot his name, but he's a huge name um, in uh, Silicon Valley, mm -hmm. right? He's been uh, a VC, uh, venture capitalist in, in Silicon Valley for 20 plus years. Are you talking about Chamath? Uh is that who, that who it is? Is an Indian guy? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And he has a series on YouTube, free of charge. Yeah. You just have to be able. You just have to be willing to spend thirty minutes, twenty minutes, just listen to the guy. Yeah, I've heard that if you spend twenty hours on one subject, you'll already be ahead of ninety-nine percent of people. That's only twenty hours. So that's why I tell like stay in school, and it doesn't have to be formal school. Continue to learn. Continue to learn. And, you know, it can be something simple. Go to YouTube. Take one of our courses that we have here at um, STC. Mm -hmm. You know, like I just mentioned, my financial literacy course. We were, like, the federal government was paying people to take a class right before Christmas. Like, <laughs> what, what, what better deal is that you were learning about investments and things like that? Like, yeah. We have the Financial Education Symposium. It's free. And if you're interested in bringing stuff from Mexico, you have business professionals telling you, hey, this is the form. This is what you got to do. That's interesting right there because I had an idea and anybody can take this because uh, I got it from my buddy Jesse De Leon, which is an e-commerce ninja and works out of far. Uh, and then I tried to do it myself. I just didn't have time to do it. But it's piñata in a box. I always wanted to get people from over from Mexico that make piñatas specific sizes that fit in UPS boxes that ship straight out across the United States. So you can only pick a certain amount of, of items that are there, right? Yeah. And it's a flat rate ship and it goes out. But I wanted to get the piñatas from Mexico. So this is a perfect opportunity for people to learn how to do that process, right. correct? And, and it's free, right? So we usually have this conference around. So if you're interested in international trade, these conferences are around mid-November. They're free of charge. Um, I can share with you the, the link for our website. Absolutely. Usually right now it still has the information from last year's conference, but come around October, you'll have the link to register for, for the new one. And, you know, just give us, give us a couple hours of your time. You can listen, with, you, you can have your ear pods on, listen to it, you know, go back and view it later on in the day. Anybody can do it. You this don't is valuable information. And I feel like one of the things that is the problem with that is that there's so much information. So people are like, well, who do I listen to? Where do I go? Why should I listen to well, this Well, listen person? to the people that are doing it day to day. Yeah. Right? We've had um, custom brokers. We've had uh, people from huge companies like Emerson come down and speak to us. All kinds. We've had people that work in San Antonio that work for Toyota shipping stuff from Asia. You know, we've had all kinds of import export people come talk to us. Yeah. And the kids are just so excited to talk to them. Like, oh, I didn't know that was part of this. Like, yeah, it, everything's part of import export. Everything comes from somewhere else. Yeah. <laughs> so, like anything that you can think of. And they're like, I didn't know that was part of this. Like, yeah, like I didn't know that you could do that. So let's go back to the most basic level of this, right. is, which is why I asked you on. So what is inflation and what is a recession and what does that look like coming in the future? All right. So I don't want, I don't want to be the I'm – a, I'm a glass half full guy. So let's start with, <laughs> let's start with you know, everybody knows, everybody knows how they feel right now, inflation. Let's start with that. The gradual increase in prices. Eggs is the perfect example. What's that? Eggs, the perfect right. example. Inflation is normal, right? To a certain point. Right? Why? Because there's scarcity in the world. Mm -hmm. We already talked about that, right? There's a limited nature in things. As we keep growing in population, as we keep going through our resources, things are going to start getting more and more expensive, right? So there's also a demand side to this. Every year, people get higher wages. So those wages are reflected in prices. How? Well, if I'm an employer and I'm paying my employees more, 
that's cost. My cost is going to get reflected in my prices, mm -hmm. right? So inflation is normal. There's a gradual increase. And, and again, I, I just gave you two examples of why there's inflation. I just want to clarify. It's normal. So the Federal Reserve, for example, has a target rate for inflation. So they, they target inflation of 2%. So, for example, so people understand that at the very basic level. If something was $100 this year, next year it will be 102 mm -hmm. That's 2% inflation, right? So, or let me, let me restate that, right? If your budget for groceries, because we're talking about just not one price. We're talking about prices overall. Mm -hmm. If your budget for groceries was $100 per week, well, next year you can expect it to be 102 Simple, mm -hmm. right? 2% inflation. The problem right now <laughs> is, or for the past year, year and a half, is that inflation hit over 2%. Mm -hmm. And we are seeing levels of 9%, 8%. Right? That's a problem because now the rate at which prices change just hit everybody in the face right away. Yeah. And so that's, what pro well, that's, that's why people are suffering because their wages were not catching up, right? So, like I mentioned, you can expect every year, every two years that your salary goes up, so your spending power goes up, but with changes like this, like what we've seen at 6 8 9%, your wages are not catching up, so it's not going year by, like, within the, f w within the year, you're seeing prices go up instead of waiting the whole year, so... Like, your prices are going month to month instead of year to year, year, to year. right? So that 2% that you were expecting the whole year, that you saw it in the first trimester, for example. And that's, that's a big hit, yeah. especially here in the Valley where, you know, wages are, are pretty low. Like, we're looking, I was looking at the Valley economy, and uh, I believe the, the BLS, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, they put us around thirty-five, thirty-six thousand dollars a year on oh. average, um, and I believe weekly, at somewhere around eight hundred and fifty dollars per week, and that's not a lot of money. Right. right? Well, yeah, because yeah, you, now you have to get your groceries, you got to pay your car, you got to pay all these little and, tiny and so things, if light you, bill. And if you and if you look at what people spend, that right, they and I was telling this to my students. A lot of the things that went up, especially here in the Valley, were the trifecta. Which right? is what? So the most two, like a lot of the times that you hear like experts speaking about prices, they take out food and energy. The primary reason for those is that those are very volatile, mm -hmm. right? Like, for example, why are eggs so expensive? It has nothing to do necessarily with the economy. Well, why did eggs become so expensive all of a sudden? I don't know. Why? It was a bird flu. Okay. So it just wiped out a ton of birds. Exactly. Right? So food is very volatile. Going like back that. to scarcity. Yeah. So less eggs, more expensive. Yeah. Right? Gas prices, very volatile. It depends on OPEC, what they want to do with oil prices, right? If they cut production, right? And again... We blame whoever's in, 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 the, in the Oval Office. Again, we're not part of OPEC, right? We go and, and like, hey, hey, don't do that. But they're like, yeah, yeah you're, you're not part of this. <laughs> we world. got a business. We, we got, got a bottom a line. <laughs> right? So, um, so they're very volatile prices. So they usually take away those out to show us, like, inflation. Right? They call it, like, PCE without food, right? But... Take a look at what was going on. Like OPEC just cut prices. They they cut oil production. So what's been going on with the petrodollar? Yeah. No, no, no. Just cutting oil uh, cutting oil production. It's increased the price of gasoline. Okay. That's energy. So energy has gone up. Well, actually, energy will tell you like actually there's a lot of things with energy. There's also nat natural gas. So I'll show you some data right now. I'll tell you where to go. Um, so energy has actually gone down, but food, right, has gone up dramatically, right? 
But for a while before these numbers came out, energy was also hiking up. And that remember that President Biden released some of the, our reserves mm -hmm. right right before the midterms. There's a political reason for that as well, right? So that has something to do with the energy prices also going down. But well, we don't have to get into that. But basically, food and energy hit us. And this was a while back, like a year and a half ago, they hit us. And also housing, an influx of people moving to the valley. Hmm. Interesting. So the, the, the three major categories of things that we spend on are, are like, what are your major things that you spend your money on? Your rent, yeah. your food, mm -hmm. and your energy, because you need to yeah, go to work. Yeah, you need the necessities. Yeah, so you hit the trifecta, and so in a very poor area, like, people here were struggling, and it hit us, right? If you take everything else away, inflation maybe doesn't look as bad, but with those really high, like those things that fluctuate a lot, it, it really hit people here in the valley really bad. So I can show you some numbers of like the most current numbers that we can that I could find here. With the yeah, absolutely. So the first page that I sent you it says the CPI and PCE index inflation numbers. Yes. So that one just breaks down all items, and you'll notice that's the little bar in red. It has a five percent in there. So all items like that's kind of like an average. 5% inflation currently. As a, so the way that they do this is that they measure inflation. Oh, they measure, like, they have an index number, which there's a way to calculate it. It's kind of complicated. We don't have to get into that. So they have a number in March of 2022, and they have a number in March 2023, and they compare those two numbers, and that's why there's a 5% increase. Interesting. Okay. Okay. So that's the inflation for all items, right? But look at the food. Wow. Right. So a lot of times when you hear like the Federal Reserve talk about um, inflation, they'll they'll go away from that because there's a lot of things that you can't control about food. You have an avian flu. You can have a freeze. You know, you can have a hurricane that wipes out crops, you know, or, or explosions that explosions, kill a bunch of cows. Yeah. <laughs> yeah whatever the case yeah. may be. Right. Or, you know, so those are very volatile. So a lot of times they'll take them out. And so you have energy. Energy ha right now, uh, I was reading up on the energy. Um, there's um, a lot of production in natural gas, right? So that's part of the reason why we have uh, a negative there. That actually, that shows us that energy has gotten cheaper, right? Especially here in Texas, energy has gotten cheaper. There's a lot of natural, natural gas here, a lot of production here, which is a byproduct of drilling. I think they... they I, not an expert, but I think they extract it at the same time. So okay. there's a lot of that. And um, and look at the last column. It says all items, less food and energy. So that's usually how they report it, and that's at a, at a 5.6. Interesting. So when you hear the, the inflation numbers, they'll usually report that one. And that's, the us that's usually the one that we go into. Okay. All right. So um, if we go to the next slide. And so that was the CPI. That's from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. The one that the Federal Reserve um, uses is the personal consum consumption expenditures. And look at the last one that they had. It was February of 2023, and that was at 5%. So how does that, how are we seeing this? I, I show you data from November, December, January, and February. Mm -hmm. What do you notice there? It's gone down. So... Everything that the Federal Reserve is doing has been working, right? Which means that they've been increasing interest rates through their monetary policy tools. They've been, so they're targeting the interest rate, making it more expensive to borrow money, which usually makes, you know, if you're buying a house, if you're borrowing to buy a car, you know, credit cards. And so it, it, it less, it, it, lessens investment, it lessens consumption, it takes money out of the economy, there's less money circulating in the economy, less, cons that less aggregate demand, so that puts downward pressure on inflation. Now, here's the thing. People have the wrong idea about like, what's going to happen to prices. It's like, oh, inflation's going to go down, so everything's going to get cheaper. No. It stays the same. The prices are not going to get lower. The rate at which they go higher is going to get reduced. Okay. 
So it just won't go up as fast. It, exactly. <laughs> you just phrased it correctly. Yeah. Exactly. So in, prices will continue to go up. They just won't go as up as fast. So you're saying that that whatever we have right now, the price is the cheapest that it'll Your ever Your water be. burger, which you're paying a number one combo. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> you, don't, you don't get like this <laughs> by not knowing your prices at whatever. So your water burger, which is like roughly what, nine bucks? Yeah. Your combo number one, something like that, nine fifty. It will still be nine fifty. But you can expect it if we if we hit our target soon. You can expect it to stay at 950 for a while. For a while. Right? No, you're absolutely right because I remember my dad would take me to, to work with him at Dairy Queen from the age of three to 30. And I remember every time I would be the guy that was changing the prices. And they always went up, they never went down. And, ever. And that's the thing you don't want prices to go down. That's even worse. So I tell my students what's the worst thing than inflation? Deflation. Think about that. I'm like, why? You want prices to go? No, you don't. Right? And I was explaining because I don't know if this happened at your high school. There's always a kid with a bag full of Mexican chips selling them at oh, high yeah. school. Right? Okay. So, uh, like, that, it was that girl. Uh, I was just at uh, Hidalgo High School. And uh, the girl that has that bag was like, wait, you don't want prices to go down? Like, that's not true. And I told her, okay. I want you to sell me those bag of chips for 50 cents. And she was like, no, 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 no. <laughs> See, yeah. you want prices to go down? Like, and why not? Well, I already paid for exactly. Yeah. You paid in advance for your product because you were expecting to get some return. Right. If your prices go down, you're not going to get your margins. Right. And that applies to any business. Your contracts where you're getting your supplies and everything are based on your projected sales at projected prices. So if prices start going down, that's a lot of lost in investment. Yeah. So the only thing that worse that can happen to us than high inflation is deflation. Especially look at all the houses that like all the housing prices here in the valley. Yeah. Like I've benefited. I know my family has benefited from the uh like I guess in, in wealth from the increase in prices because my my wealth as a family has increased because housing pr my house is now valued at a higher price. Mm -hmm. If if my house gets devalued, that's that's bad for me. Right. Right? Now you might think, well I already live in the house so it's not important, but what if you bought a house to flip it? Right. Now it's a, now it's a bigger problem yeah, as an investment. That's yeah. an investment yeah. to sell, and so it becomes a problem. So yeah. I just want you to like, I I just want to make clear to people like prices are not going to go down. When I say that inflation is going to go down, it just means that the the um, the rate the rate at which it happens at, at, at which it happens is going to get slower. So let's talk about a recession. Okay, so our recession is two consecutive periods of economic activity where GDP goes down, production. So when we're talking about the basic economic variables, we talk about three things. We talk about production, right, as a country. How much do we produce, right? Prices, which we just talked about, and we talk about jobs, right? So the production is difficult because the only way that we, like the only variable that economists have been able to figure out, I mean, there's a lot of ways that, People like to measure um, the well-being of a country, but the only way that economists like to do it is through GDP, gross domestic product. So it just basically, to make it simplified as I can, it takes all the production in the country and puts it into one big number in terms of dollars. Okay. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. yes. So everything, think of anything that we produce we are taking its dollar value and we just add it up. So whether it's this water bottle, we don't produce these, but let's say that we did. Mm -hmm. We produce a cell phone, a water bottle, a coat, anything, anything that's produced. Out of the United States. In the United States. And I mean, not sold, produced. Okay. Produced. That's our GDP, our gross domestic product. And we measure it based on, like we adjust it for inflation, so we call it real GDP, right? So if that number goes down for basically six months, 
two consecutive economic periods, which is like quarters. So usually you see like, oh, this quarter. What does a quarter mean? Three months. Mm -hmm. So if, if it goes down two consecutive quarters, then you're in a recession. Interesting. So that just means that that the United States isn't producing as much as they used no, to they produce. No, they're actually producing less than the previous quarter. Okay. And they have to do it for two consecutive quarters. So th and that could tie into how 10 to 12 million businesses are failing every year? So let, let's go let's go into it. So I uh, I don't have the graph on you but um uh, let's see. I can Get it a little bit closer to the mic. It's right after a, a, a table that says, what is a recession? I got it. There's a little graph. It mm -hmm. says change in real GDP. So this one is not measuring GDP per se. It's, it's measuring the rate of change in GDP, if that makes sense. Yes. Okay. So you notice the numbers on the side. It says like a zero. Mm -hmm. And then it goes negative. So look at 2020 in the bottom. Yes. Notice how it went below zero. Mm -hmm. So what do we have in 2020? A spike. A spike down, right? Mm -hmm. And it went negative? Yeah, it went negative there. So that actually was a recession. Okay. Because our, our GDP growth was negative. And that actually, if there's other graphs that I can show you, but you know, I, I, I didn't share them with you, um, where it actually... The last recession that we had was 2020. For quarter four of 2019 and quarter one of 2020, our GDP went down, and that's why it's considered a recession. Okay. Right. So the last, the, the like the last three months of 2019 and the first three months of 2020, GDP dropped. It went negative, and that's what you see in that data. You see in that spike, in like from 2019 to 2020, you see that spike, right? It started in 2019, and it, it ended midway through 2020. Mm -hmm. And then what happened to GDP? It started recovering, right? Mm -hmm. So it was a very short recession. It, it just met the requirement for a recession. Interesting. So then what, what does that mean for the, for the people that are living here that go through a recession? What happens? Well, okay. So, and, and let's explain that one because that was a weird recession that happened because whatever theory you want to believe about the COVID-19, right? So either somebody ate a bat at a wet market or it snuck out of a lab. Whatever theory you want to believe, I'm not going to get into this, right, in this podcast because uh -huh. then you're going <laughs> to, it's going to go viral, We'll right? trigger the algorithm we'll, we'll, here, we'll, man. We'll, tr we'll, we'll trigger it, right? So whatever theory you want to believe, COVID happened, Yeah. right? We closed down. There was nothing wrong with our economy. Previous to that happening, there was nothing wrong with the economy. The only thing during that time was that we had to close down, right? Or else more people would have died. Right. That's obvious, right? So what happened? If you close down, you're not producing. So what happened to our GDP? Yeah, it went down. Drop. And we opened up after six months. And what happened to our production? It went up. The only, like, the previous recession was, and it's called the Great Recession, it was in 2008, and that was because of a banking crisis. That one was called the Great Recession, and if you look at it on, like, there's another graph. The shaded areas that you see there, you see some gray areas on the graph? Yes. Those are all recessions, right? And what do you, sorry, what do you notice happens to the blue line when you hit those, um, Great areas. It falls and then it, it falls. Comes. So that's our GDP. That those are examples of recessions. Right? And the last one that we had before the pandemic, which I wouldn't even consider like a real I mean, it was real because people suffered, right? I, I don't want to take anything away from that. But it was not real in terms of there was anything wrong with our economy. It was just we had to shut down. There was a, a deadly disease out there that we all had to take care of, right? So but the one where we had something wrong with our economy was 2008. Mm -hmm. Look how long that one was. Yeah. So one thing that I always teach my students is that recessions are, 
or economic fluctuations, we call them economic fluctuations, are um, irregular mm -hmm. and unpredictable. Notice the spacing between them is unpredictable. Right. Right? You can't tell when the next one's coming. I don't care who you are. You can be a Nobel Prize, uh, Nobel Prize winner in economics. There's a lot of people right now saying, oh, we're going to a recession. We're going to a recession. We're There's some meme of people saying we are in a recession. It's but you true. won't know after the fact. Is it? You, you will know after the fact. Yeah. That's the thing. With data, you don't know till that we're like, we don't know what's going to our, like, what, we don't know what's going on with our production until we look at the data, right. <laughs> which is after the fact. How long does that data take to come out? Is well, it, it, so we collect data like for three months. And then like, it's three months is the benchmark. And then it takes a while for us to collect it and analyze it. Or not us, right? But right. The people that do the Bureau of Economic Activity and, and BLS and the Federal Reserve and all the people that analyze it. And then they report it, right? So think of that. Like there's three months we're collecting data, collecting data, and then there's a period of analyzing the data. And then there's a report. So if we went, if we're going through a recession, we won't know until we after. won't know until the data's out, right? Yeah. So that's one thing. And there, you can't predict them, right? Now there's projections, mm -hmm. and I have some data that I showed on the PowerPoint for projections. But notice that, like, you can't predict them. Somebody, like I said. Whatever theory you want to believe. Somebody ate a bat. Somebody walked out of a lab with the thing on their shoe. Whatever. And we had a little recession in 2019, 2020. And, and in 20, uh, 2008, banks got crazy with the amount of loans they were giving. And look how long they, they, they lasted. So not only are they unpredictable, they're irregular because you don't know how long they're going to last. Right. Okay. So that's the one thing I want people to understand about recessions. You cannot predict them. I don't care who you are, right? So let's not get totally alarmed. So how, so how can people mitigate their losses? Okay, so now that I said this, let's look at the data. Look at the data that the Federal Reserve has projected, right? So change in GDP, right? We, every year, our economy should be growing. We have a very, like, I would say, like a very um, mature economy, right? So for an economy such as ours, we should be growing like maybe at like a 2% rate, 2 to 3% rate. That's usually like what we, that's, that's a good rate for, for the country to grow. Look at the numbers that we're growing at right now. See the, the blue line? Mm -hmm. That's the actual. For the past year, that line has been trending what? Down, okay. I Down. See here. So we are growing, but, a very, but at lower and lower rates, right? We should be growing at around like at two. But currently, and if you look at the numbers in the bottom, change in real GDP, you see that where it says 0.4? Yes. The predicted growth for this year is 0.4%. Hmm. We should be growing at 2%. The predicted growth is 0.4. Wow. Think about that. So <laughs> I was telling my classes yesterday, you know the Selena song, Carcacha? Uh -huh. And if you ever had a car like this, you know the feeling, right? <laughs> you have a Carcacha and, and uh, you don't know. You don't know what's going to happen to your Carcacha, <laughs> right? It's like sputtering, sputtering, sputtering. It might take off. Yeah. But it also might break down and leave you there. But you don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it is showing signs of slowing down. It is showing signs of slow. Now, the Fed, and this is where you get into those little whiskers. You see those little, um, once you get out of that, like you see 2023, 2024, 2025. Uh -huh. You see those little whisker little things on the side where the, where the red line is? Yes. And, and what is the trend there? Now, like, now it's going up. Now it's going up, right? And by 2025, we should be hitting our, what, our 2% growth. Hmm, interesting. So they're saying it's slowing down right now because of inflation. Inflation, like at these prices, we cannot sustain our growth. 
everything's too expensive for people to go out and spend, right? If you can't afford it, then people are going to start not spending, right? It, it, everything's too expensive. And what do people start doing? Start cutting back. Cutting back, yeah. exactly. And so you have, like, let's think of the luxuries, like going out, going on vacation. Well, I can't afford that. Yeah. So that lowers our production, right? As we start getting these prices down, we should start seeing our production numbers go back up. Interesting. So right? that that... When we, I guess we go back where people are into, so well, let me say this. So the thing with how people can mitigate this is by not spending money on stuff they simply don't need. Exactly. So well, and that's what they're doing already, basically. Are they? Because I would I would say <laughs> the, the number one life hack is that from what I see is that people just spend money they do not have and they right. keep buying stuff they don't need to impress right. people that right. don't care about them and they so, keep doing it. So, and so I would say right now, right now, and we were talking about this at the beginning, right now is the, one of the best times to save. And it's actually, if you remember the Silicon Valley uh, thing that happened like the last SVB month. Bank, yeah. yeah. So what's been happening with interest rates is that the Federal Reserve for a while now has been increasing. And part of the reason that this is happening, the sputtering and sticks like that, a lot of that has to do with, you know, like I was mentioning, higher interest rates, um, we start consuming less. There's less money around. There's less investment. The housing market is going through a rough time right now. It's hard to get a loan right now. You're looking at interest rates six to seven. If you're buying a car, yeah. you're probably looking at nine, ten yeah. percent. We, we, you know, and with people's credit down here in the valley, you're probably looking at. So it's not a good time to buy a car here in the valley, especially with prices and interest rates. It's horrible. Um, the car lobby is probably going to hate me for that. <laughs> but um, um, so, so what but, there is, but there is an upside. With these higher interest rates, there is an upside because if the Federal Reserve is making it harder to spend, it means that it's also making it better to do what? Save. Right. So part of the thing that happened with Silicon Valley was that investors were looking at this at how... It's, let's think of inv like treasury bills, right? Uh, long term, short term. Like they had all this, um, in all these investments in um, like securities and treasury bills that were paying very low interest rates from the past because mm -hmm. interest rates were like historically low in the past. So they had all this paper that they had invested in that were paying relatively low interest rates. And now that we have higher interest rates, a lot of these banks and companies were saying, hey, give me my money so that I can buy this new paper because this new paper is going to pay me a lot of money. Right. Right. Well, the problem is that the banks didn't have the, <laughs> the banks didn't have the cash. Right. So that's where the banks started running into liquidity problems and the Fed had to step in and the banking system is relatively safe now. Yeah. But. The point here being that if you're starting to think about investing, these higher interest rates are good, right? Because if you start putting money into uh, talking about mitigating for the effects of a possible recession, which, mm -hmm. as you can see here, unpredictable, in the graph, unpredictable, and looking at the projections that the Fed has, if we if these projections follow through, we are not going through a recession, because. And I'll show you the, um, I think I showed you the, the price stuff, mm -hmm. right? The, I'll show you right now again so people can see it again, how the prices are going to behave over the next couple of years. We should be hitting our rate in the next couple of years. Not this year, but we're going to be hitting our rate soon. And once prices stabilize, then we should be back on track. So, but you're going to have your savings already, right? right? So... That's and that, that's, the, that's the other part is like, where do people invest? Because I think a lot of people are like, well, well I don't want to so keep my money in the bank. No, 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 the banking no. systems are failing. Yeah, so um, there's other places to invest. And so go check out our programs. There's a lot of financial literacy courses out there. UTRGB has them. STC has them. Mm -hmm. Like I just mentioned, I offered one this past Christmas. I'm pretty sure there's new sessions, new sessions coming up. So just... Go to the universities. They have a lot of free information out there, right? So let's uh, let's talk about alternative investments for a second. 
Because I, I'm super interested in that. I've been a, a huge uh, advocate for. Can, can I just show? Sure, you absolutely. Be, before before we go into that, can I just show you the, the yeah, absolutely um, the numbers for? Because I, I want to make sure that people understand that uh, if you go up on the presentation where it says PCE inflation, I got it. Notice what's going to happen. So currently we're like above five, and I want you to uh, I want people to understand what's going to happen to inflation in the next couple of years. We're not going to hit our inflation target of 2% till when? After 2025. Mm -hmm. But the solution is working. It's just... It's going to take, take time. Take, taking a lot of time, right? So I just wanted to go into that, okay. right? And I want to make sure that people understand that this is going to have consequences in the labor market. As we start hitting our inflation target, there are going to be some jobs lost. So for the next few years, jobs are going to continue Actually, to go down. So we're currently at a 3.6 unemployment rate nationwide. The prediction for the end of the year is 4.5. Wow. So, all right, and, 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 it's, and it makes sense, right? Because look at the prediction for PCE. Right now, inflation is at 5.5, right, roughly? Look at the prediction for 2023 by the end of the year. It's going to be at three point something, right? Mm -hmm. three so they're, they're saying, look, we're going we're gonna to take a big bite of this this year. So guess what? If you start fixing inflation, the other variable is going to spike up as well. Interesting. So it's not that we want to get people unemployed. Right. It's just a consequence. Interesting. So, okay. So going, staying on that, how do people make sure that they don't lose their jobs? Is it, and, and I've always had this thought as like skills for skills. one skills and then skill stacking. So kind of touch on that. So make yourself unfireable, right? Um, you, we have a great institution here and allow me to plug in my 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 college right we have a great institution here that offers really cheap courses in technology right in technical skills right all this stuff that i see here you can learn how to do most of it at stc right so for somebody that's growing as your podcast is, you might be growing, so you might, some, maybe you'll need help sometime in the future, right? Right now you're doing it maybe on your own, yeah. right? If you grow, right, you can be the next Joe Rogan. Yeah, that'd be great. <laughs> that'd be great, right? <laughs> so maybe you grow and maybe you need a new, uh, Joe Rogan has Jamie, right? Yeah. So maybe you need a Jamie. Well, make yourself on, on like make yourself on fireable. Go take little credentials. That, like the way of the future is credentials, accreditations, right? Little six-month courses, one, two-semester courses where you get accredited and your boss is going to see that. It's going to build your CV and CV and CV and CV. Who gets fired first? Yeah, the ones at the lower. The, the ones that are low skill level, mm -hmm. right? And going back, to our, going back to our table there that we were looking at, technically automatable activities, right? Yeah. If you go down the list to the people that are needed, information, technological services, management, a lot of certifications in management. We have a lot of certifications, for example, in payroll. Mm -hmm. You have a company, you have a secretary, right, that handles everything. Go get certified in payroll. Are you going to fire the person that runs your payroll? Right. Yeah. You're right. Right. So go get certified in something. Skill have your stack. boss have your boss pay for it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right? So how do you how do you make, like go get your certifications? Yeah. Skill stacking. Skill yeah. stack those certifications and achievements that, that way. That's you the way of the future unfireable. because you don't have to you don't have to spend two two years in school, get a, an associate's, get a bachelor's. It can be as easy as just get a certificate in payroll, get an associate's in this, get get certified, get yeah. certified, get certified. 
right? Do the market like get in drones, mm -hmm. right? So you can do marketing, and you know, you know, there's yeah. a lot of stuff that you can do, and STC offers all of that, and it's cheap. Yeah. That, right? So let's touch on alternative yes. investments. So I've been a huge uh, fan of Bitcoin. What are yeah. your thoughts on Bitcoin and uh, digital currency? Well, <sighs> digital currency, uh, cryptocurrency, not American digital currency that's coming. I'm not a financial guru. Um, I would say that some of the luster and that has faded, especially with all this inflation and, and as as interest rates begin to as as, as rates for regular investments start increasing like they have right now and especially if they keep increasing or they stay at this level i think some of the big money is going to switch to just your regular investment again i'm not a an expert in this area. My my expertise is not necessarily like investments and finance. Um, I can I can guide you into where to get these investments, mm -hmm. but my general thoughts are that some of the luster has been wearing off, be and and it has to do because there's there's choices now. Before interest rates were so low that regular saving or investment avenues were very unpopular right so interest rates were so low that regular like treasury bills securities were not paying that well not that they are and they are fairly secure right they're not as volatile as bitcoin mm -hmm. or these other alternative ways of investment i think the serious money is switching back to to this and that's just I don't have data to support that. Yeah. But I think as these interest rates and, and the interest rate should be going back up soon again, mm -hmm. I believe the, the last session they raised it to like around 5% and it's going to go back up. And this is the federal funds rate. So that should trickle down to all other interest rates. As interest rates keep going up and people start seeing that as a better form of secure investment, People are going to start switching some of those funds that they invest in. And obviously, if if there's switching going on, maybe you'll see a drop in Bitcoin. Because I still don't see a... Like for Bitcoin, part of the reason that people were so uh, infatuated with Bitcoin is like, oh, that's the coin of the future and it's going to be decentralized. But there's really like, for what I've read, it's not something that can be used as a payment method. It's more of a store of value. So um, as long as it mean as, as long as it keeps being just a store of value and not a medium of exchange, it, it'll be kind of kind of weird to see it like skyrocket like we saw it before. But I might be wrong. Yeah. You know? All right. So to finish all the podcast, yeah. What are some tips that you can give to people? For one, and then for businesses going into the future, like how, how can they help themselves? I think number one tip for businesses is just adapt to the new economy, which is very digital. Adapt what we were discussing before, cost structures. Take advantage of the digital technologies that we have available, digital media, um, Facebook, Instagram, marketing tools that you can use to your advantage that are very low cost. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I just went to a, um, a deli that's not too far from here, New York deli. Yeah. Right. And, and I talked to the owner and he's like, how did you find out about this place? Instagram. He's like, you know what? It's been a lot of clients have been saying that very low cost. It's very, very, very successful for that business. Yeah. So adapt to the new technologies. Don't go old school. Like, this is how my parents did it. This is how it has to be done. Like, go learn about all these new techniques on Instagram. They're very low. They're very cost effective, and they're going to help your business. You're not going to compete in this, in this environment. Like, for example, in the food industry, you're not going to compete against McDonald's by making a better burger. 
Yeah. You're going to compete against McDonald's by lowering your cost structure. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, because that's what McDonald's did, right? Do they make the best burgers? Yeah. That's, you know. It's debatable. It's debatable, <laughs> right? But I know that they make some of the cheapest burgers. Yeah. And look at it's, where they. Well, it's about the business that can stay in business the longest. Exactly. Yeah. Right? And how do you stay in business? Start looking at your costs, right? Adapt. If you, if you can go without a space and live in the virtual world, more power to you. Right? Yeah. Look at where you can make your margins, right? Adapt. There's a lot of spaces, right? Don't get married to one idea, right? Hit the market, and once it hits the market, listen to your clients. Listen to your clients. What does the client want, right? It might modify your product, and that's fine, mm-hmm. right? Because adaptability. Adaptability. That's the one thing that I would tell businesses because that's like, look at what Target did. You don't want to go into my store? Fine, I'll take the product to you. Yeah. Right? L- little things like that. Little things like that. Um, society is changing. These new generations are nothing like our previous generation. Yeah. Right? So listen to them, what they want. Right? It's hard to relate sometimes, but you have to. If you're in business, you have to relate to these new generations and yeah. what they want, how they want to receive information, how they want to receive their products. Yeah. So that's one thing. For people, I would suggest get informed, get educated, right? There's a lot of free resources out there. We're not telling you to go pay for high-cost um, high education. No, 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 no. Just... Like you were mentioning, get on YouTube. Listen to some of these people that offer their sessions free online. If you can afford it, go to a conference, yeah. right? Reach out to universities. Hey, do you offer any sessions on business planning? Do you offer any sessions on, on um, you know, financial, financial planning, right, for families, right? Most of them will say yes, and they're free. Right? We're serving the community. That's what we're here for. I know STC has a lot of these things. Right? Get certified. Make yourself unfireable. Right? Because, again, there are signs that the economy is sputtering. I'm not here to alarm anybody. The projections show that once we get inflation under control, numbers will pick up again. However, unpredictable. Right? Yeah. Be prepared, right? Start putting money on the side. Start preparing yourself for, like, how do I make myself unfireable to my boss? Yeah. What am I bringing to the business? Because what we were talking about before, who has the power? Can my boss simply say, well, a machine can do that for me? Right. Or I can change my way of doing things and I can give Jose or Pepe or Juan your job and he can do two jobs at once right right so make yourself what you were saying with that term skill stacking skill stacking yeah. right little things like that that you can do on your spare time like what are you doing on your spare time yeah right these are courses that you can take online right so that's that's my suggestion always look to get educated because certification is the way of the future that's what people are looking for what can you bring to my to my company if you're if you're on that and if you're running your own company adapt adapt always adapt right yeah. everybody has a plan but be be ready for that punch in the face when you hit the market because um people want what they want and it might not be what your idea is right, right? and you have to be ready for that and be accepting of that awesome uh, before we finish off the podcast, I'd like to remind everybody of what I do with Alamo Digital Agency is that we're an advertising agency that focuses on the whole Rio Grande Valley. We get your ads on digital media, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Google, all those type of things. But we've been able to help grow businesses right here in the Rio Grande Valley by serving their ads in front of a ton of people, getting people in the door. So, guys, we'll see you on the next session. Peace. Cool, man.